All right, we are live on YouTube. All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. It is 2 p.m. Mountain Time or 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, and yeah, just wanna go and make sure we have everything, um, uh, time for everything. And let's see, our IT guy is sending me a text message right now. So hopefully, is the survey active? Um, yeah, Greg, I think the survey is active. We should be good on that. It closed out and sent uh, Claire there earlier. So mm -hmm. I believe we should be good on the survey. Um, so today we are going to be talking a lot about engineering design challenges and a particular project um, that we have worked on here at Starnet called Project Build. Uh, we're wrapping up the project and we thought it would be a great chance to share some of those resources and share some of the ideas behind the project as well for you all. Um, so just to get started and to kind of orient yourself on Zoom, don't worry, you can't break anything so you won't, um, you won't mess anything up. If you want to adjust the camera, uh, view, or if you want to adjust the slide view, you can make those bigger, you can make those smaller. Uh, no worries at all. If you, uh, <laughs> again, you won't, you won't mess anything up for everybody else. Um, the toolbar is going to be either at the bottom of your screen or at the top of your screen. And sometimes that will pop up with chat box messages, or that's how you might access a poll or a Q&A um, or something along those lines. So just a quick little orientation. Um, shouldn't need to do too much on your end. When you are in the chat box, please make sure you're addressing your messages to all panelists and attendees. Um, that way we will all get to see your message. If there's something that you wanna just send to one of the panelists, like, um, I don't know, hey, we can't hear you or something like that, you can make it out to all panelists, but otherwise make it to all panelists and attendees. Let's see, uh, I'll repost the link bank or Beatrice, if you wouldn't mind reposting the link bank in the chat box. This is gonna be, we're gonna be referencing a few different websites, a few different activities, a few different resources. Um, and you can find those by going to that link bank and then um, clicking on the links. <laughs> All right, so I'd like to go ahead and introduce um, everybody. So of course, my name is Brooks Mitchell. Uh, you've probably seen one of our webinars before. We're joined here by... I'm Claire Ratcliffe. Uh, I also work here on the NCIL um, professional development team. So I'm just here to kind of help out with some of these hands-on activities today. Yeah. And our, uh, we have two stars behind the scenes right now. One is in the chat box. His name is Greg Mosshammer. Greg, if you want to say hello in the chat box, um, he'll be doing a lot of the interaction with you all. He'll be dropping in links. Um, if you need something, if you're like, hey, I missed that link earlier, Greg, can you drop it in there? He will happily do it for you. Uh, we also have off to the side our uh, colleague, Beatrice. She's going to be helping in the chat box. If you want to say hello? There you yep, go. There's her yep. hand. <laughs> so, uh, and then if Justine, Susanna, and Janine, if you want to jump on real quick and say hello. Hello. <laughs> no. Hello. Good coordination there. Awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. Would you like to share a little bit about just really quickly where you, uh, what institutions you're from? I'm Susanna Hamm. I'm the children's librarian at the Parma branch of Cuyahoga County Public Library. Um, I'm Justine Rose. I'm a civil engineer with AECOM. And I'm Janine Finton. I'm with the American Society of Civil Engineers. I am the senior manager of pre-college outreach. So I get to work a lot with people like Justine. Wonderful. It's good to see you all again. Uh, I think I've only met you all one time in person, but it's, I've seen you so <laughs> uh, So I'm going to go jump into the agenda. We'll hear from Susanna. Justine and Janine a little bit later. But yeah, we have a jam-packed agenda today. We're gonna start with a poll question. We're gonna get into a little bit of the project. Um, we're gonna hear from Janine on the American Society of Civil Engineers role in the project. 
uh, going to be doing a couple of hands-on activities because it's a StarNet webinar and we have to do hands-on activities. Uh, and then we're going to hear from J uh, Susanna and Justine on their experience working together on this project. Uh, and then if we have time, we'll do a little bit of Q&A. So we got tips, resources, ideas, and hands-on activities. So I think that's a, yeah, a good combo as always. Uh, so let's jump into a poll question. And I hope this isn't too unsettling for everybody. Um, I was trying to find some good kind of trivia questions just to break the ice a little bit. So let me go ahead and launch this poll. It should just come right up there. Okay, what percentage of bridges in the United States are quote unquote structurally deficient? 1%, uh, 4%, 9%, or 0.25%? So that is one quarter of a percent. So again, what percentage of bridges in the United States are uh, considered structurally deficient? I'll give you all about five more seconds. All right, I'm a little surprised that you all were uh, spot on with this. 9%, isn't that alarming? That is really alarming. I, know. I was really <laughs> hoping for the 0.25%. <laughs> Now, I'm not sure what they're defining as structurally deficient here, <laughs> but this came from the, um, oh, where was this data from? Like the U.S. Department of Roads and something or another. Michigan bridges are even worse. Yeah, I'm sure locally, geographically, uh, there are. I wonder if that's because of the, the cold or I something don't know, in yeah. Michigan. Um, so a little alarming, but that proves our point today that engineers are so important and that we need more engineers uh, of all uh, backgrounds of all diversities of all uh yeah we want mm -hmm. as many engineers as possible so we'll go on to the next uh this one's going to be a little bit less frightening okay where can you find watch this one where can you find the longest bridge in the world that travels continuously over water i mean this one still kind of scares me because of the last one you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> 9% are structurally deficient. I don't want to go over water with that. But yeah. Again, why engineers are so important. Yep. And we'll give you all about, I don't know, 10 more seconds on that one. All right, closing in three. Two, one. All right, so let's see. We've got a pretty nice uh, dispersion here. I thought putting Washington State would trick people. It's definitely not Washington. Um, Saudi, <laughs> Ar Saudi Arabia, that was a trick one because like, was, I don't really think of a lot of water in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Belize, just the first country that came to my head. China is home to like the three longest bridges in the world, but they don't run continuously over water. That would be on uh, the Pontchartrain Causeway in Louisiana. So it's like when you're going to New Orleans, I've been over that bridge. It does go a really, 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 really long way. Wow. Uh, and travels continuously over water, I think for 20 plus miles. Wow. So yeah, there you go, uh, Louisiana. All right, so let's go ahead and jump in uh, to our presentation today. So we're talking about Project Build, and this is an NSF, the National Science Foundation, funded project um, that is a big partnership between us at StarNet, the American Society of Civil Engineers. Uh, the University of Virginia is handling the research side of this project, and, they, um, and EDC is our evaluation partner on this project. So those are some of the lead organizations, but really the, the true players in this are the libraries themselves that we're working with. And I just want to give them a quick shout out, Anchorage Public Library, Philadelphia Free Library, Canwell County, West Virginia, I always mispronounce that. Sorry, West Virginia, we love you guys. Uh, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, that's the Broward County uh, library system down there, the African American Research and Library Cultural Center. Uh, I think I got that acronym right. Uh, the Cuyahoga County Public Library System that we'll hear from today, are it might just be Cuyahoga Public Library. And then the High Plains Library District in Greeley, Colorado. So a wonderful, wonderful set of partners. But Project Build, um, its main goal is to investigate whether the infusion, well, I'm not gonna read this, you can, you can read this. Uh, but really to bring STEM related resources and engineering resources to increase interest and engagement of youth in grades two through five. Um, so this started, it's a project that's near and dear to my heart because my second day on the job here at StarNet uh, was the kickoff meeting for Project Build. So I feel like it's the one, the one project I was really here from the beginning for, and I've gotten to know everybody that's worked on it so well. 
So the big, big challenge, uh, or one of our main big challenges that we're trying to solve, um, minorities and or just underserved and underrepresented populations aren't well represented in engineering. There are a ton of stats that you can pull from this, and I feel like I don't need to um, tell this to you all. You're a very uh, intelligent audience, but when we look at minorities that are actually getting engineering bachelor degrees, it's a really, really no, low number compared to their um, or their, their representation of the population. So African-Americans, and this is data is from 2016, uh, whereas they represent 14.8% of the college age population, they only account for 3.8% of engineering degrees. Uh, American Indian and Alaska natives, 0.9% um, of the college age population only account for 0.3% of engineering degrees. Latinx populations, 21.4% earn only 9.6% of engineering degrees. Uh, when you look at women in engineering, um, there are similar numbers. Uh, we see that they are not very well represented in gaining uh, bachelor degrees in engineering, and even more so going from that step from bachelor degrees to actually being in engineering, uh, there's an even more, uh, an even bigger drop off. I don't have the percentage numbers off the top of my head, but it's pretty easily researched um, that you can, and, and again, it's, you know, we know that STEM fields, STEM fields are not always the most diverse and well represented groups. So with that and our, uh, thinking about that, we thought, you know, well, libraries, we love working with libraries. That is a great venue uh, to maybe help solve this problem. So we look at libraries and this is from 2012. So these numbers aren't totally up to date, um, but in, if anything, they've gone up a little bit. Uh, so 16,000 library locations, 77% serve rural populations, 72% uh, Latino use or Latinx use in libraries and 69% African-American use. So libraries are really well positioned being that inclusive, equitable, um, oftentimes a direct one-to-one -one match with community demographics. Libraries are a great institution to bring engineering uh, to different communities. So what we did, <laughs> uh, and we kind of worked backwards. Uh, instead of finding the libraries that we wanted to work with and then recruiting engineers, um, we worked with Janine to find six wonderful different outreach chapters of the American Society of Civil Engineers that we knew had good um, outreach components. And then we found libraries that uh, were nearby and would be able to work with those engineers. Now, instead of having an engineer go up and do a, I don't know, 15 minute presentation on, uh, you know, or a 20 minute PowerPoint presentation on the science and engineering behind their latest project, we thought it would be better to have engineers that maybe look like uh, the patrons that they're serving. So if we have a young, uh, uh, young Latinx girl, if they can see a Latinx female engineer, Come to the uh, come to their library and talk to them and do a, a hands-on activity with them. That's likely to um, that's likely to make them see like, oh, you know, this can be this is a viable career profession for me. This person looks like me. Um, I can do this. I can be an engineer. So a few pictures here. The top two are from the uh, from Arlick uh, in Broward County, Florida. The bottom one is, on the bottom left is from Philadelphia Free Library. Um, and then on the bottom right, I put this engineering design logo. Uh, this isn't. Uh, the engineering design process, the idea of thinking, building, testing, and do it again, is definitely not something that we created. That's, uh, you know, just part of the engineering uh, cycle, if you will. Uh, but we took this, uh, took those ideas and put it into one circular logo to show that engineering never really stops. You're always redesigning, you're always rebuilding and testing and prototyping. Um, it's a constant process. We'll have a link for that engineering design logo if you'd like to use it and print it off. If you're doing an engineering design challenge, it's a great logo to have to remind the patrons that it's okay to fail. So some of the different things that we did with Project Build, um, we did a big, we have a big research component to it with lots of surveys. We won't get into that too much. We also have a community dialogue aspect of it. Um, if you may have seen a webinar that we've done about community dialogues uh, before, um, but it's a great way to, to hear the needs of your community. Um, and we'll get into it in just a little bit, but those are very six unique locations. So we really needed to, to have some regional relevancy and some really important community connections there. Uh, we did training, so we had all of these libraries come out to Denver um, for a two-day training, and we also uh, did a series of webinars just for these libraries. Um, Elena will tell you, we've been pretty involved in, in making sure the libraries are up to speed, and to be honest, they've trained us a lot, too, on some of the best practices. And lastly, this kits and activities section. So, uh, of course, we love hands-on activities. There's a great way, they are a great way to engage your patrons in STEM, um, but we wanted to find hands-on activities Thanks, Elena. Hands-on activities that were regionally relevant, that were engineering-based, and that could tie into, um, that an engineer could come and, and do at a library. So again, we're looking at these six locations, 
that's pretty widespread of places. Uh, Greeley, Colorado is quite different than Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, Anchorage, Alaska is quite diff different from Philadelphia. Um, and the problems that they face are different, right? Uh, so an engineer in Greeley, North, uh, in Greeley, Colorado might be focused on, uh, I don't know, like uh, flooding or maybe earthquake uh, activity. Whereas in Florida, they're worried about storm surges or high winds from hurricanes. So we were thinking like, we have these six locations, they're really unique places, what do they all have in common? And we realized, well, they all use engineering to solve real world problems. So they build bridges, they deal with natural disasters, although those natural disasters can be you know, a, a little bit different. They clean up pollution, which is what we're gonna do a little bit of today, and they promote sustainability. So using these four main themes, we developed um, four different collections or categories where our libraries could go and find activities that were regionally relevant, but also tied into a greater theme. So I'll give you an example for that. Um, Design to Survive is our module or collection, whatever you wanna call it, um, that is really fixated or focused on um, how engineers uh, combat natural disasters or how they uh, build around natural disasters is probably a better way to say it. Um, and of course the natural disasters that happen across the country are all different. And when our Broward County um, colleagues were getting ready to do this module, they were actually hit by a hurricane. They had to delay the, the program. Um, and I remember talking to them and saying like, hey, you know, it might be a little sensitive to do this. And they were like, actually, there's no better time for us to do this storm surge activity from the design to survive module. Um, you know, it'll really like, it'll really be impactful because our, our patrons are actually going through this right now. Um, so if you wanna check out on the clearinghouse, we have those four collections. It's also in the link bank. I'm already running over on time, so I won't uh, show you all where that is, but it is um, very easily found in your link bank. Um, Beatrice, if you wouldn't mind dropping that link bank in there one more time. We also have these two pr uh, promotional logos that you can use, the program icon, ready, set, create. If you wanted to print that out and put it over like a standalone um, activity station, you're more than welcome to do that. And then again, that engineering design process that shows that you know we're always in that engineering design pro uh, method of thinking, and it is truly okay to fail uh, that's why we test, that's why we do it again, that's why we prototype. One last little thing I wanna talk about is the kit component to this activity. Um, and ah, gosh, Elena, are these, is this picture from Greeley? Uh, I'll let you respond in the chat box. Uh, but again, we know that engineering doesn't just happen at the library. Uh, engineering can also happen if uh, patrons can take some of that stuff home with them as well. So we, okay, thank you, Elena. Um, so we helped our partner libraries develop kits. And when I say we helped them, we gave them a few basic ideas and let them run with it. Um, so you can see, this is like a set of Kiva planks and balls. This is to build a bridge. Um, so this is a kit that you could check out and take home. We didn't tell this library specifically, you have to do this one. Um, we just said, here are some good activities. You know your audience better than we do. Um, here are some yeah, commercial, commercial things you can buy. Here's a budget, of course, um, and let's have some calls to talk about this process. So these are more, again, more commercial based. We have connects um, and then we have a zone tool. Um, it can be a little tricky with those tiny pieces. Uh, some of the libraries found that weighing them with a scale was an easy way to kind of assess whether they were actually getting returned all the way back or fully back. This is a really fun activity um, called uh, oh gosh, just, I'm blanking. Uh, go green with squishy or with creative circuits because we couldn't say squishy circuits. Um, so in, you're using alternative energy. You're using a hand creek generator in essence to power a, a squishy circuit um, creation. And uh, yeah, so those are our checkout kits. Again, we did not develop these. Our, we uh, worked with our libraries to help them develop really regionally relevant checkout kits. Um, and you know, kind of using their own checkout policies. Um, we've learned a lot from these libraries on our circulation kit website. Um, you can find some of the lessons that we've learned from them. So I feel like I just talked a lot really quickly. <laughs> I'm gonna catch my breath for a second. I'm gonna turn things over to Janine Fitton of the American Society of Civil Engineers. And she's gonna talk a little bit about, about this project from their perspective. Okay, thank you, Brooks. And as Brooke said, I am from the American Society of Civil Engineers, and I was thinking about that stat about the structurally deficient bridges. And that's one of the things that people at ASCE definitely keep an eye on. We have some of our engineers who are the folks who say, yeah, this is a structurally deficient bridge. And just to put that in perspective, what does that mean? 
it may not mean that the bridge is immediately about to fall down, but think about it in terms of a car. You know, you have your car and your tire pressure is getting low or the tread on your tire is getting low. And somebody might said, say, that, oh, you know, your, your tire is getting structurally deficient. Does that mean that you have to immediately replace the tire? No, but you should probably replace it pretty soon. So next slide. Civil engineers, in case you don't know it, we are the people who help folks live in healthy, safe communities. And that includes many forms of transportation infrastructure. It also is clean water, you know, getting clean water to your house, taking dirty water away from it. We help to build ports and airports. And we also are very concerned about the health of the environment. So, one of the benefits that we have with the civil engineers is that they are spread across the country. There's not necessarily any one city or location where you're going to find all or a majority of the civil engineers. Every community has a need for these kind of services. So it puts us in a good position to be able to work with local schools and local libraries. Next slide. And that's just me, in case you want to reach out to me, you can contact me by an email and you can also give me a call. Part of my job is in fact to connect schools, teachers, students, librarians who maybe have a need with, um, you know, who want to have a, an engineer, want to have a civil engineer work with them. You know, I can reach out to all of our local sections and branches. Next slide. And this is actually a throwback to my history. Before I worked for ASCE, I was actually a library associate in Harford County Public Libraries in Maryland. When I started working with ASCE, I had a need to illustrate an activity that demonstrated retaining walls. And I knew that the library had sand. So I came in to borrow their sand. And what you're seeing there in that box is toilet paper that is actually holding up that stack of bricks and books. And it would have held even more weight if I had had more bricks with me and I simply didn't. The end of the box was open and the sand could have poured out, but yeah, that toilet paper held it in place. And that's a reference to how civil engineers use something called geocloth when they're constructing things. Next slide. One of the things about ASCE is that we have a philosophy when it comes to outreach is that we want to get our engineers involved. And that means that we're not just supporting teachers, but we are actually focused on getting our engineers out into the community as role models. The guy on the left is a structural engineer. He works mostly in New Jersey. This was the USA Science and Engineering Festival here in Washington, DC. And, you know, 350,000 people in three days. We also believe very strongly in forming coalitions. So working with the National Center for Interactive learning and the StarNet library system fit very much with our goals. And so it's been a wonderful partnership for us. Next slide. One of the major outreach initiatives that we've been involved in in the last few years is that ASCE actually produced a film called Dream Big, Engineering Our World, that is still showing in IMAX and giant screen theaters at, at museums worldwide. Now we actually own the film and one of the things that we built into it was that we wanted this to be able to be used for outreach at schools and also at libraries. So if you want to circulate this in your collection, you'll need to go ahead and buy it in the normal ways that you buy things. But it is possible to view the film at the library. It is licensed for educational viewing. Next slide. 
We also have a complete suite of materials that go along with Dream Big, and we have over 65 activities and lesson plans. We also have about 20 videos that go behind the scenes. So something about meeting the women engineers. We also have a webisode that's done in Spanish, and we have a variety of educational webisodes. If you want to go a little bit further into things like autonomous vehicles, you can do that. The website is discovere.org slash dream big. That's available to you. It's free, no charge. You can just go there and download these materials. A lot of these were used as a foundation for the materials that we've used in Project Build. But um, the Project Build library has them um, in a format that we particularly made a little bit more librarian friendly. Next slide. Oh, so this is one um, we did actually talk to our our, our engineers about what's coming up in terms of the summer reading theme. So you can go ahead and, and get all of them listed there. And we had we, we also have webisodes or, or web meetings for our engineers. And we had one several months ago about the upcoming summer reading themes and encourage them to get in touch with their public libraries and figure out ways that they could actually do outreach programming with you. And these were just some of the concepts that we came up with as we look forward to the future summer reading themes, like imagine your story. Well, you know, castles and, and weird structures like that, building a castle to withstand attack. Minecraft is a great um, video game that kids like to play. And yet that is a, another form of civil engineering. And we also at ASCE have something called Future World Vision that I'll talk about in a moment or two. But I just wanted to give you an example of how it's very easy to incorporate engineering and well, of course, civil engineering into upcoming summer reading programs. Next slide. So the Future World Vision is a project that ASCE is working on, and we are trying to look at what is the world going to look like in 50 years. So we envisioned five future cities, and we are in the process of collecting additional information. And this is a serious project. This isn't just a, a, a project for people who are imaginative and want to fantasize about what the future is going to be looking like, it's an opportunity for civil engineers to really stop and think about what materials are going to be like, what the cities of the futures, the infrastructure needs will be like, what they need to take into account. And, you know, if you look at the things in blue, those are some of the um, likely scenarios. So as in about 10 years, they project that 15% of new construction is going to be 3D printed. So those 3D printers that many libra libraries have there in the building and you have fun printing parts, we are actually using that technology in civil engineering to build houses and bridges even right now. We're also envisioning things like floating cities in the future frozen cities, what are cities off planet going to look like? And, you know, it, it's a lot of fun. Sometimes, you know, there, there are some things in there, the things in orange, or what if we have a problem like a mega storm? So those are all aspects of how you plan for the future. And yeah, we as a legitimate civil engineering society are looking at things that I would say fit really well with the fantasy and science fiction that libraries have. Next slide. So how do you find engineers? And this was something that I had to do a lot of when I was working at the library system. And I had a lot of different ways that I found engineers. You're lucky because first of all, you know that you can reach out to the American Society of Civil Engineers and we recommend using our outreach at ASCE.org or you can contact me directly and say, you know, we'd like to get in touch. We'd like to see if you guys could do programming for us. ASCE does have lesson plans and programs pre-kindergarten through 12th grade. 
you can also reach out to your local industries. And I know that some of you are at, um, in, in rural areas and you might be feeling, well, we don't really have local industries, but if you are in a, a, a rural area where maybe there's the large scale farming, believe me, there's a lot of engineering going on in agriculture. So if you can contact those farms and maybe you know, that's a way of finding the agricultural engineers, industries, you can contact their human resources department that might be able to tell you if they've got any chapters of things like ASCE. We do have chapters that are specific to some industries. If you have universities near you, if they have engineering departments, they may have student chapters of different engineering societies. Now, I threw the alphabet soup onto this slide, mostly because it was a lot less wordy than writing out the Institute for Electrical and so-and-so engineers, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, the American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers. You can Google these. Um, the first three are actually what are called technical societies. The last group, SWE, NSBE, SHIP, and ASIS, those are affinity societies. So the Society for Women Engineers, the National Society for Black Engineers, the Society for Hispanic Professional Engineers, the American the, um, Indian Society, uh, Science and Engineering Society, American Indian Science and Engineering Society. And these are affinity societies. So these are people who really want to make a difference or support each other because they represent some sort of a minority. And if they have chapters in your area, they're often very good sources for people to do outreach. So I look forward to, I think that's my last slide now. So I look forward to seeing what kinds of questions you might have for me. And, you know, now I'm going to turn it over to, or turn it back to Brooks, I believe. Awesome. Thank you so much, Janine. Um, yeah, and I was just saying, I, I pulled a lot of my statistics from like the Society of Women Engineers and um, National Society of Black Engineers. They're great, great groups and definitely worth reaching out to. Um, and I think, yeah, they might be used to, again, like coming and doing a presentation about their work. And I think if you um, just uh, tell them, hey, I'd love for you to come and do some fun hands-on activities or just come hang out with the kids and talk a little bit about what you're doing, not a you know, presentation, then they would be really big on that too. So um, awesome. So let's jump into our hands-on activities. The first one we're going to do is really fun. And I, I have to admit, it's not actually an engineering design challenge, but it is meant to set up an engineering design challenge. Um, so when we look at the learning differences or, or learning preferences of, of boys and girls, um, there's been research that shows that uh, young girls aren't necessarily going to want to jump into an engineering design challenge or, or um, uh, be engaged with it the same way as, as a little boy might. And of course, that's, you know, just certain, uh, statistical data that's not like 100% uh, um, of, the, of, the, of the time case. But um, so we, I wanted to show you basically what I'm getting at, sorry, as I stumble over my words, are that young girls are, uh, could be more likely to engage with a narrative-based engineering design challenge. So I like setting up this, uh, we'll do a, a water filter engineering challenge, but I like setting it up with this narrative um, because it, it creates a story there. And um, some people, again, might just engage with that better and they might um, not know they're doing engineering and might be more invested in the uh, story. So who dirtied the water? It's basically you're reading a historical account um, of, of how your town or how your area was settled. The one on our STEM activity clearinghouse is specifically for the Boston Harbor, uh, but it is really easy to modify this story for your location. So the one we're gonna do is based on our location, which is here in Boulder, Colorado. The story time is meant to kind of have a literacy connection. Um, again, you can make it a local connection as well, and it is uh, meant to really set up the next activity. Um, so this is just kind of the setup, and you can change this a lot. Um, the idea of this activity is, as you are reading it and as you're reading this story, you have your kids dump tiny little pollutants. Um, they're in, you know, they're going to be in a uh, non-transparent uh, container, so they won't know what's in there. They'll dump those into the water. They'll see the water getting really, really, really gross and make that connection with like, oh my gosh, like, um, you know, as, as we've settled and as we've uh, made cities around the United States, we've really, really polluted the water. Uh, let's see. 
some of these different pollutants, these are just some ideas um, that uh, you can use pretty much anything that will dirty your water. Um, but so when I get to the part about fishermen, it's cool to throw in some nylon line. Or when I talk about um, sunbathers or swimmers, it's cool to put in some sunscreen to see how that affects the water as well. So I do want to go ahead and jump into it because we don't have a ton of time. Um, Claire, I'll read if you want to pour some of the things in there. Sure. And let me go ahead and stop sharing this. I love story time. I thought, you know, the library audience, you guys might appreciate this. So let's see if this works. I'm going to share our second camera there. So you should just be seeing a big old jug of water. Now, if I were to do this normally, I might have a really, really, really big tub of water. But for our purposes today, this is going to work just fine. You just want to be able to see through it a little bit. So let's see. And Claire, I know we don't have all of these things. We have about six or seven different pollutants. So just if you hear something I'm reading about, grab it in there, throw a little bit in there and stir it up. All right. All right. So this is Who Dirty the Water Boulder Edition. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful piece of land. The land was surrounded by mountains and had a river running through it. Fish lived in the water and the land was covered by grassland. The land and the river teemed with wildlife. Uh, so let me, let me ask you guys, would you want to swim in this river? Yeah, looks nice and clean All right. and fresh. Would, would you eat fish caught in this water? Absolutely. Would you like to go tubing in this water? Heck yeah. All right, those are some bolder things to do, right? <laughs> uh, okay, so the river carried sediment uh, down from the mountains. So we'll pour a little bit of sediment in there. Is that just, yeah, some soil. Thank you, Beatrice, for getting this from outside. Okay. Grassland grew along the edges of the river. So we're going to put a few grass clippings in there. All right. Um, let's see. A small group of people lived on the land near the river. The people called themselves the Arapaho. The Arapaho fished for food and used the river for transportation. They also dumped some of their garbage near the river. So I believe this is some... Which one is that? <laughs> Let's see. Oh, give me some toilet paper. Here's a little bit of garbage. Yeah, oh, I think this one actually, Claire. This one is like uh, we would do like crushed up seashells or like oh, yeah, gotcha. so like um, smaller little bits of debris. All right. So let me ask you all: Would you uh, would you want to swim in this river? Probably still swimming it. Yeah, probably still swimming. Uh, would you eat fish that were caught in that, in that water? Um, yeah, there's just a little bit of garbage so far, but I start to be hesitant, I would say. Yeah, but it's natural things. Yeah, it's know? mostly natural. And grass. would you all like to go tubing in this water? Oh, yeah. I would definitely this wouldn't deter me from that. No, no. All right. So after many uh, years, settlers from Europe came to live on the land. The settlers built a town much larger than the Arapahoes. Some of the town's garbage was dumped into the river. In the mountains above the river, miners chopped down the trees. And without trees, rain carried soil into the river. Let's see, put a little bit more soil in there. Ooh, starting to get dirty. Starting to get a little dirty. All right. And let's see, with the settlers, we might, you know, maybe put a little bit of the uh, toilet paper in there. More trash. All right. So let me ask y'all, would you, Beatrice, would you swim in that water? Probably not. Probably not. Okay, getting kind of getting a little monkey. Uh, Claire, would you eat fish out of that water? Um, if I'm pretty hungry, maybe. Yeah, I think it yeah. depends on how hungry I am. Uh, and let's see, I would probably still go to the. Oh, I would still go to Okay, so we're gonna skip down to the last one. Um, so we're gonna skip a, a, sec a section here, but this is kind of like modern day. So the city of Boulder continued to grow as it did. The city built laundromats where people could wash their clothes. We're gonna put in a little detergent in there. Ooh, Ooh gross. <laughs> um, let's see, the laundry detergents went down the sewage pipes into the bay. People cleaning their houses used poisonous cleaners and drain cleaners, uh, which also flew, flowed through the sewage system. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah, it's pretty gross. Um, even swimmers left a mess as their sunscreen washed off into the river. So we're just going to spray a little sun sunscreen in there. Oh, oh that's good. <laughs> oh, gosh. This is some dirty water. And let's see, do we have anything else here? Some sand and crusty. I think, you know, I think this is plenty dirty. Claire. This is pretty uh, So final time, I'm going to ask you this. Uh, would you want to swim in this water? No. No. Would you eat fish caught in this water? Totally not. 
would you like to go tubing in this river? I mean, probably not. <laughs> yeah, it depends on how much fun. Yeah. I, it, I mean, even, yeah, if I really, really wanted to have fun and go tubing, I still yeah, think I, I would, would try to find another that. activity. Yeah. So um, <laughs> you can see as, as we've gone on, and um, as we've retold different parts of, of the history of Boulder, our water has gotten much, much dirtier. I would say if you do this on your local level, um, be culturally sensitive. Um, uh, talk to those populations and um, just think, you know, everybody has a different kind of history behind where they live and just be mindful of that um, as you are developing your own story. Um, awesome. Okay, so we have created our really dirty water. Let me go back. I'm going to stop sharing. You can just leave it right there, I think. Ugh. Uh, and then, I bet it is. I'm going to go back to our PowerPoint slideshow. And we are now going to uh, clean up that water. So we're going to do another really fun, simple activity, low tech water filter for a high impact clean. I love this one because you can really do the engineering design process. You can really go back and repeat yourself um, and you can fail and it's okay uh, as long as you're not having to drink the water. So, uh, so for this one, there's a real world uh, kind of story behind it or, or not really a, a real world connection if you will um so in bangladesh um they are oh gosh now i'm blanking on the oh i, I think it's cholera um is a big uh problem that they have um in terms of like dirty drinking water leading to cholera um, there are these tiny little creatures called copepods i believe uh that are, are in that water and they found the local populations there in bangladesh were using their sari cloths uh, and they, their sari cloths were just the right thickness or just the right um, permeability, if you will. If they wrapped it, I want to say twice over, um, that was the perfect amount of, um, or the perfect filtration system to, to keep those copepods in the water. So super low tech solution to this problem. Instead of bringing in like, you know, water, even advanced water filtration techniques, this population realized, oh, these sari cloths that we use, like uh, if we just fold them twice over, that is the perfect uh, permeability and it'll filter out those copepods um, and you know it's uh, it'll help us stay healthy with our drinking water. So a pretty cool real world application. There's tons of other real world applications, um, and I would just encourage you all to make that real world connection when you do um, activities like this. So let's see. We'll just go to this slide and we'll start sharing that second camera again. Okay, so for this activity, and you should be able to see me um, up on the screen and over here, we, it's really simple. Um, you just need a variety of filtration materials, and I'll just show you what we have. So we have these basic plastic bottles. I've cut them in half, and I've attached a cheese cloth to the end and put it around a rubber band, right? So we have a container right here. I'll probably just show you under here. The container right here for the water to fall into, and then we have the top where we're actually going to be putting our low-tech water filter. Now from there, it just depends on what you have and what you have available um, for your filtration things. So I had some time to plan. So I got, I'm just gonna get my stuff out and show you. We have some like aquarium gravel, right? If I don't knock over water, this <laughs> webinar will be a success. We have some coffee filters. We have a big old bag of sand. We have some um, cotton balls. And what did I do with that? Oh, here it is. And we have some activated charcoal as well. So Claire, we have this really, really gross, dirty water. Mm -hmm. um, and actually let's put a little bit more soil in there just to make sure it's super dirty. Oh, gross. That's what happens when you cut the trees down get erosion. Yeah, that's looking pretty gross over here. So Claire and Beatrice, I would love your thoughts on this too. With all these materials, let's just use, I don't know, what do you guys think? Maybe let's use two materials, okay? Let's see how much we can filter this water just using two different materials. What would you all think that we might want to put in here? Hmm. Let's see. Cotton balls. Cotton balls? Yeah, yeah what do you all think? Cotton look, balls? Come maybe absorbent. All right. Let's throw like five of those in there. Okay. All right. And let's see, one more thing. What do you guys think? Some, the pebbles? All right, yeah, sure. And we'll put some pebbles in here. And then we'll- I wanted to get a suggestion. 
What did they say? Charcoal and coffee filter. Charcoal. But Mary, if we got it right on the first try, how would we show you the redesign process? <laughs> All right, we're gonna put some charcoal here. I mean, some gravel, excuse me. Okay, so we've got gravel, cotton balls, and cheesecloth at the bottom. You guys think we should try it out? Let's see what happens. All right. Now, if only there was an engineer on the webinar that could help us uh, solve this problem and figure out, okay, I'm just gonna put a little bit in there. <laughs> Cue Justine coming up, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me put a little bit more in here. So Justine, what do you think about our water filter? Um, it's, it's, it's not gonna be perfect. Okay. <laughs> uh, it might filter out the, uh, the copa pods that you're yeah. talking about but <laughs> but that's about it yeah it's looking pretty gross honestly yeah, the water coming let's through. see let's see how it looks at the bottom let's see if i can show you i don't know would you drink this beatrice no i wouldn't drink this i would not drink that water that okay. is not the color i want water to be when i drink <laughs> yeah. and justine what kind of engineer are you again uh water you're a water quality engineer. Oh. engineer. Let me just ask you, Justine, how might you go about doing this? Because I just so happen to have an extra water filter. Well, there's a couple things to keep in mind when making a water filter. Um, the first thing you want to keep in mind is that uh, there are different sizes of particles that are um, that are floating in the water and some particles that are dissolved in the water. Um, and so when you filter, you're going to want to filter the largest particles out first. So if you think of how the water travels through a filtration system, you're going to want to get those largest particles first. Okay. Um, the second thing to keep in mind is that uh, that activated charcoal, um, that has uh, a specific property where it adsorbs um, pollutants that are uh, dissolved in the water. Mm -hmm. So that can actually pull out, you know, the very, very smallest particles that are, are really dissolved in the water. So um, that's going to be an important part of your water filtration system. Um, and uh, because it's going to get the smallest particles, you kind of want that process, you know, near the end. Okay. Um, also think about, uh, about, um, the different sizes of the particles. Uh, so for example, if you have, um, you know, you don't want the, uh, you don't want the smallest filter capture, capturing the largest um, objects because it's gonna get easily clogged and then it'll take a really long time to filter um, mm -hmm. all of your water. Mm -hmm. So keep in mind all of those scientific principles and see what you come up with. Okay. I, let's see. So I might put one cotton ball like at the bottom, okay. just one. And then what do y'all think about some of that activated charcoal? It sounds like. Yeah, I like Mary's suggestion, uh, the and activated charcoal. And the coffee filter. So maybe filter. put some activated charcoal in the coffee filter. So you can also do an extension to this to where you're working with budgets and certain materials have different budgets. Um, that totally... That way you kind of prevent some over engineering, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe some sand around that? What do you all think? Yeah. You think uh, that, that might- What do you guys think? Should we add some sand or do you think this is sufficient? What, don't ask me. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I keep going. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. the size of the particles that you're going to want to filter. We want, yeah, I'm, I'm nervous about like some of the grass and some of those bigger things. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe instead of sand, we'll do something bigger. We'll do the gravel. Okay. Yeah. I can figure out where. And I, I like that point too, that, um, that we don't want to clog it, you know, yeah. get too much stuff. Cause I've definitely been camping in the back country before and had to, uh, filter my own water and it takes a really long time and can get frustrating. Yeah, so, right, right. Um, like what is the most effective, but maybe not overdoing it. All right, let's try this out. Also want to be, make sure that Justine and Susanna have enough time to present. Okay, so y'all, we have aquarium gravel up top. 
We have activated charcoal underneath that, and then we have a single cotton ball. Gonna pour this in here nice and gentle. All right, it's looking a little bit better. See some debris already getting caught at the top. Yeah, we'll compare these two. We'll see. Still, um, I'm still gonna say I'm not gonna drink this water. <laughs> Let's see if I can put them up here to compare. Oh, cool. You can actually, yeah, it's a little bit different. It's not a great view for y'all, but <laughs> all right. Uh, it's still a little bit dirty, but it's a lot better. Again, I'm still probably not going to drink it. Uh, Justine, is there any chance that you might have a filter that you'd like to show us? Um, well, uh, I have to say that last night I put together two filters. Uh -huh. um, and I put them together in a very specific order and I tested them. And then uh, today, when I arrived at the library, I uh, put them in a box and I put them on top of my car and then they fell off of my car and spilled all over me. Um, <laughs> so this is, it's not really quite in the same order that it was in when I put it together last night. Um, but there are a few things that I wanted to point out. Um, we, uh, we did, can you? Yeah, you're, oh, you want me to go back to mine? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we decided to um, put some tape around our filters. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, you know, when you cut it, sometimes it can be a little sharp for um, tiny little fingers. So um, we, that was one of the things that we added. Um, my filter was originally set up with a uh, some, uh, some t-shirt material down at the bottom to kind of hold everything in place. Mm -hmm. um, and then a, a bunch of cotton balls down at the bottom, um, a layer of activated charcoal. Uh, and the activated charcoal that I used was, um, was in flakes instead of like the larger pellets. Oh, okay. Um, and um, I tried one, see this is like the, the, the pellets. Mm -hmm. um, but the flake sizes, uh, they have more surface area. So it actually is in contact with the water for a little bit longer. Um, and then it, again, it's, it's a little destroyed, but <laughs> on top of that, I had, um, a layer of sponge. Um, and then on top of the sponge, I had a layer of sand. Um, and then on top of the sand, I had another layer of sponge and that layer, uh, was there to trap the particles that were um that were a little bit too big for the sand so that the sand wouldn't get clogged and then on top of the sponge i put a layer of um aquarium gravel so that's how that's how i had set it up um and then and then i promptly destroyed it <laughs> um you, you love librarians so much that you're willing to pour dirty water all over yourself <laughs> yes yes so i'm uh, pretty covered in sand um oh my gosh <laughs> Well, on that note, I guess I'm going to turn things over. Um, I'll pull up the PowerPoint slides. I know we don't have a ton of time left, but um, if you guys would like to speak about your uh, involvement together, working um, uh, specifically with Project Build and just talk, yeah, if you want to talk a little bit about that, I'll go ahead and pull up your slides. And sorry, just bear with me one second. All right, and just, yeah, tell me whenever you'd like me to go to the next slide and um, yeah, turning it over to you all now, thanks. Okay, well, I'm Susanna Ham. As I said, I'm from the Cuyahoga County Public Library. Um, I'm Justine with Eight Health. Okay, so next slide. And the next one. There we go. <laughs> All right, um, so an important thing is to kind of define your roles. So engineers, um, the, 
the engineers should kind of work as the library's partners. So we're not coming in to kind of take over and, uh, and you know, put up a lesson and, and give a presentation for the kids. We're really working with the library um, in order to help the kids learn. Um, librarians should do more of the sort of classroom management, um, maintaining order. Uh, as an engineer, I don't have any idea how to do that. Um, <laughs> and um, really, uh, everybody should kind of join in and, and work together to participate and, and um, you know, encourage the kids and help mm -hmm. facilitate their experience. Next slide. So uh, while you're planning your program, um, some things that are important are to agree on your goals, figure out what you're trying to do and how you're going to do it. Keep it hands-on and active. Kids learn a lot by doing. Um, so you're not doing a big PowerPoint. You're not doing a lecture. You're trying to find fun activities that everybody gets to participate in. You want to try each activity before you present it because things may not work exactly like you think they will. And ahead of time, decide who's going to lead each part so that you, everybody knows what's going on and you can smoothly move through the program. Next slide. Um, the more facilitators and, and volunteers you can get, the better, um, because you want you know, a, a larger volunteer to child ratio. Um, and then afterwards, get feedback from your volunteers, talk about how it went, and talk about um, what you can do to make the experience a little bit better the next time. Next slide. So when you're presenting the program, you want to focus on the experience, not the product. So it's not about creating a filter that looks exactly like our filter. It's about thinking about what you're doing and, and learning by doing. You want to praise thinking, persistence, and creativity. Try, it's really hard. We've been conditioned to keep saying, good job, good job. But you wanna try not to do that because that's actually discouraging. <laughs> so things like, oh, I see how you kept trying. You know, oh, your filter didn't work. You know, what do you think you could do differently? Uh, don't take over or give the answer. Sometimes you almost have to put your hands in your pockets. Um, let the kids keep trying, and if they want the answer, try to use questions to lead them into doing some thinking of their own, and use open-ended questions. Okay, next slide. Um, you have to re be uh, flexible. Um, be flexible about group sizes, about the agenda. Um, things change. Sometimes you get a lot more kids than you were expecting. Siblings come in. Um, kids of different age groups will come in um, and be flexible about the agenda. Sometimes you lay out a certain amount of time for something and then it turns out the kids are having a lot of fun and you can just let them continue that, uh, that activity. And sometimes you can tell they're really getting sick of it and it's kind of time to move on to the next thing. Um, right. So be open with stuff that's kind of happening in the room and, and um, be ready to work with them in order to improve their experience. Right. So for librarians, I would say go over programming basics with your partners. Remember, these are engineers, they're not librarians. They don't know your rules. They may never have worked with kids before. And there's a lot of assumptions probably on both sides. So talking about how things work is really important. Uh, make clear any library policies, um, you know, who's allowed to work with kids, are there safety rules? Are you allowed to take pictures? All that kind of stuff. Um, and feel free to contribute ideas about what may excite kids and engage them in learning. Um, you, know, you have probably worked with kids more than the engineers. So even if you don't know the subject material, you probably have a feeling for uh, if you're presenting it in a way that the kids will respond to and understand and get, get into. And you don't have to know everything. Work with the kids to figure it out. Call the, say, I don't know, let's see if we can figure it out. Or say, hmm, let's get somebody else's opinion. That could be a kid at the next table or it could be one of the engineers. Um, and that's actually a lot more fun than you saying, yes, this is how to build an arc. <laughs> so next slide. Um, so a few tips for engineers. Um, a public program is really, it's not as structured 
uh, as a class or a lecture. So, um, you know, have some flexibility with what the kids do. If, if a kid doesn't feel like doing it and they just want to color, that's okay. It's not, you know, my job to make them do the activity that everybody else is doing. Um, remember to challenge kids to figure it out. Um, it, sometimes we really want to just say, hey, this is how you, this is the best way to build a filter. Um, but you have to kind of give kids some starting information and then let them roll with it. And then once they figure it out, it's so much more rewarding. Um, encourage them to keep trying and redesigning. Uh, sometimes they get really discouraged if they put something together and it doesn't work. Um, but remind them that it's okay. That's, that's why we're doing this activity. You can try it again. You can get more materials. Um, it's okay. Uh, really talk about your work and relate it to what the kids are doing. Um, and also, you know, connect the activities to the kids' experience, uh, for the pro the, um, you know, uh, the dirtying the water activity, we talked about Lake Erie and we talked about the Cuyahoga river that everybody knows caught on fire 50 years ago. Um, <laughs> and it, it has not caught on fire since it was right. 50 year anniversary <laughs> this year. Um, but we, we told the kids that story and it was something that they had learned in school and we showed them pictures so they could see, you know, Oh, that's how this happened. Um, mm -hmm. and it, you know, it really connected them to, uh, where they live and their, uh, environment. Okay. Next slide. So lastly, have fun. You can see this is Justine and Sean, another engineer that worked with us, and kids. And I think they look like they're having a good time. They tell me they had a good time. Um, <laughs> but basically, uh, kids learn more if they're having fun, they're open, their brains are working. So think of you're coming to play. You're not, you're not coming to impart, you know, these five engineering facts. Come and give them an experience of trying to design something and solve a problem, and they'll learn more, and they'll uh, enjoy it and be more open to more experiences like that. And you're there to have fun, too. I mean, mm -hmm. um, if you're enjoying yourself and it's clear that you are excited about your work, the kids are really going to pick up on that. So that's it for us. We're uh, here for questions. Awesome. Thank you all so much. And, and you said you think he, they were having fun. I just want to zoom in on that kid's face. <laughs> he was definitely having fun. And just, you look like you were having fun too, so. <laughs> so yeah, if anybody has any questions, I know we're um, a little bit past the top of the hour, but we could take a few minutes for questions. Uh, Greg just posted the certificate of attendance in the chat box. When I close out of the webinar, you will be redirected to a survey. And on the last page of, page of that survey is the certificate of attendance, or you can just access it there. But we would love if you would take the survey. One thing that really stood out to me, Justine and Susanna, you were talking about like be flexible. And if the kids are having fun with something, even if you plan three activities and, and the first activity they're so engrossed in that they're doing that for an hour and a half, like that's awesome. I <laughs> would consider, yeah. consider it a, a success. Yeah, we've had that happen. <laughs> yeah, it's always better to plan more. And if something is kind of a flop, and sometimes you're never sure, sometimes there's an activity you're sure they're really gonna like, and then it just doesn't eh, doesn't really go anywhere. Or it doesn't really work. Or, you know, or it doesn't yeah. work. That's why I said try everything first. Um, you know, move on from that. But also, you know, we usually have more planned and then we don't get to it all. Um, but you can always use it again later. It's funny you say that even for this webinar, I was like, we got to have so much planned and um, can't, and then of course, you know, when it actually happens, you, you mm -hmm. fill up the time pretty quickly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, Justine, had you done much work in libraries before getting involved with Project Build and ASC? Um, I, I had not, I had not done a lot of outreach. I mean, libraries kind of hold a special place in my heart because my mom worked in the library system. My dad worked in the library system after he retired. Um, so they were always kind of uh, near and dear to me, but I had not done outreach with library systems. Gotcha. Um, I know personally, before I started working with libraries, I was so, I just asked that, I was so surprised that like, well, libraries are doing STEM and libraries are um, such big hubs of resources. Yeah. Storage closet. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Sorry about the announcement. <laughs> Um, and then Susanna, one thing that you said too, and I always talk about this uh, when we talk about, you know, some, being a guide on the side or just leading, facilitating programming in general is you're learning with your patrons. You are not an expert. Yes, you can maybe organize things well. You can bring together materials and you can promote your, your program, but you are not an engineer. And I know, you know, it's just as exciting for me to learn about engineering as it is for, for the kiddos sometimes. So I think you're, I always say libraries are really uniquely poised to learn like with their patrons um, mm -hmm. and it helps when you have uh, awesome engineers there too so do we have any more questions no i don't think there's just some people saying we'll definitely use these activities um okay. really if you if you need advice on like oh hey i'm doing a program about this and which of these activities do you think would be best or do you guys have any extra resources or videos we could show just um feel free to let me know and i'm happy to find that for you um and Anna, or Anna said, she says, our middle school is reading the longest walk and we can talk about bring water and we can practice filtering. So another fun way to do that water filtering activity that I've done with a different organization is do, uh, yeah, make your own water filter. You can have the cheesecloth on the end, but you can only use natural materials that you find outside. So like. Oh, interesting. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And someone mentioned earlier that you used uh, nylon instead of cheesecloth. So yeah, yeah just Ooh, yeah. different ways to problem solve and think. And what I love about this is there isn't one right way to do it. Like that's what engineering yeah. is all about. We all have our own uh, ways of thinking through problems. So. Mm -hmm. um, one quick tip that I had about the um, about the filtering activity, if you do use activated charcoal, it's a really good idea to rinse the charcoal before you do the activity. Otherwise, the kids all end up with charcoal dust at the bottom and they're like, why did the water come out dirtier than it went in? Right. You know. it's brown, it comes out black. Tip, yeah. you get and I would say that this is more fun if the water gets dirtier and if the kids get to put the stuff in themselves. So don't stand yeah. at the front and say, now I'm putting in grass and now I'm putting in totally. whatever have them and they they're excited about wondering what's in my jar and, yeah. and the grosser the better and uh, <laughs> this, and you really stir it up and get the you know get the bubbles going from the soap and everything and they, it's really fun this is one in particular that I was surprised I was like oh it's just you're just pouring stuff into water and you're making it dirty how much fun could that be and then I heard the libraries be like oh we got so many oohs and ahs and grows and uh, <laughs> So I'll show you what we did because it's a little bit different, of course, when you're doing a webinar, but um, we just took these little bottles and we labeled them. So you can't really see, but this one says sand. Thank you, Beatrice. And this one says like uh, oil. So when you get to that part, um, you know, and you're reading your story and you say, and then the people came and they polluted the river with oil. And then you point at the kid that has the oil one, they dump it in there. They, um, you know, circle it around and, uh, yeah, so that way they, they don't know what's going in beforehand and it is kind of like, oh gosh, so gross. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, well, I think we better sign off for the day. It's 3.06, so um, Susanna and Justine and Janine, thank you so much for being on today. Justine, thank you so much for your work in libraries. Um, it's so awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Working <laughs> with librarians and it's just such awesome success. So. I look forward to a few months from now when we can share the results of this project and we can tell you all what an overwhelming success the evaluation points to. But um, uh, <laughs> we'll see you on a webinar before then. And um, yeah, thanks everybody for joining. Yep. Thanks guys. Have, Have a great, great rest day. of the week. Bye. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>